so <laughs> the thing that is is with the soap. Like, think about it. What you just mentioned was this that is a private why, conversation. Why was why is soap not cylindrical? Yeah, shaped like funky. Like, a, why is it a bar? What is a bar? What other shape is shaped like a bar of soap in the world? Besides, like a, maybe a gold bar. Maybe I. I mean, what other things do you do? You, can you reference that are are square and blockish that you would use on your body? Things? Nothing. 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 So what you're <laughs> what you're proposing is that we change soap more natural shapes to be a natural shape that's <laughs> cylindr- a cylindrical, cylindrical, yeah, sphere. Yeah, or a sphere. Like it's a more ball. natural. Yeah, like if a you're ball. gonna wash your butt crack. Would you prefer a bar up your butt? Or, or is that thing <laughs> cylindrical? <laughs> oh, oh, man, yeah. I'm sorry. People yeah. on their commute, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. How was the Jake Paul fight? It was interesting, man. I um, That means I, it sucks I, if you say it's interesting. No. You, you never say anything. Was it fun? Yeah, there were, there were <laughs> aspects of it that were fun. Like, listen, I, 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 I like Jeff. He's super, super fun to be around. He put yeah. together a great... You Jeff Wu. Yeah, Jeff Wu yeah. was great. Like, and, uh, I imagine you were front row, like, could probably taste Jake Paul's sweat. Oh, uh, I don't like to envision myself in that <laughs> circumstance, but yeah, listen, I, I like, I like just like the, you know, fighting in general, I guess, in the, the context of like, you know, you go to a boxing match, go to UFC, you go to the, the Jake Paul event, which is, like it's it's it it was interesting. Like it, it was very very interesting. What were the most interesting parts of it? Um, there are distinct differences between the UFC and obviously what what you know Jake and his team are putting on. I think uh, I I think it's a new it's a new business for them, right? It's it's like a whole new. new thing so, that they're so, doing. So it's so it's, crazy. it's really interesting to see how people are building brands within their their communities and then looking at you know how how are they entertaining people right it's just like this is in, this is entertainment yeah. and yes it's their profession they take it really serious they 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 go out they're they're ultimately activating across multiple different social media platforms and they're entertaining uh you would be just absolutely remiss not to see the the entertainment value and then looking at it from you know, fighters and who's doing what. Uh, there's a lot of brands participating. That that was like, like my curiosity was around like, how are brands participating in this? Like where, where are they activating? What are they doing? Because you, you see the, the there's a lot of big brands that are who's activating. Some of the brands? Celsius is the biggest one that's probably the most overtly present. Mm. So... That's not Jake's. No, Celsius thing, right? is just a. Is it? Well, it's not just. I, I like Celsius. Energy drink. It's really good. Yeah, it's good. So it's interesting to see how brands are in integrating into this form of entertainment, and then how they are represented on the floor, how they're represented in the stadium. Like it, it's just it's different. It's a different medium. How so, many people were in the in the place? Uh, Fifteen thousand. That's a lot. Yeah. Did you feel like the energy of the crowd? Oh yeah, it was like there was like three fights that broke broke out outside on the on on the floor. It's oh, solid. it's one of those. Like, um, but you know, like I said, the, Cody was there, so Donut was there, yep. and Brandon Herrera. So I hung out with those guys for a while. Yeah, uh, Nico. All, all, like there, there's, it's a very social media centric uh, portion of marketing it's very social media there's a lot of people and by the way this isn't neither brandon herrera or cody like they weren't like taking their photos phones out like taking selfies and stuff but there's a ton of that like yeah everybody there is got the cell phone out doing stuff it's wild is it yeah it's wild it's more more so than if you were to go to a, a race i mean you know, and I've been to a, di- a bunch of different events. So it's like, whether it's a football game, you know, we'll call it a NFL football game, whether it's a, I went to the masters and, you know, now I've been to multiple UFC fights, NASCAR masters, races, NASCAR races. I, I'm trying to figure out from just to be a student of how people activate in events. 
which is a big part of just understanding how do we how do we as a brand not only represent ourselves as a brand then who and how do we partner with like how are we hosting events these are all like things that are very very interesting to me mm -hmm. and so like you know jeff was kind enough to to ask if i wanted to come a few months ago i was like yeah that'd be great man let's 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 do it yeah um so yeah, and I, I tend to think about things very clinically in, in a lot of circumstances. So it's not just like if I if I'm gonna go have fun, I don't do a lot of social events to have fun. That's not that's not where I find my you know my You're not very social. I I, I am when if, you're if, enforced in social events, if, but you don't seek social events. You're not well, a seeker. No, I, I, I will go be social with my friends. Yeah. But I don't you have like I don't, two I don't, friends. I don't, I don't find like who's those friends? You, I'll go be a. Yeah, uh, I, I go like to. I like to be social with you. I like to be social with Matt, Jared, Logan. You know those people. Like I, I truly like being around them. I also like going to social events where it's like, like uh, an SF ball would be like super fun for me, right? That would be rad. Yeah, it's like yeah. it's all a bunch of SF guys, right? Would you wear a uniform? Fuck no. Oh, I, I don't know. No. You don't want to rock that AAM, that Army <sighs> Achievement Medal. Don't you have a mustard stain on yours? I got it taken. Yours? I got mine taken away. They they detabbed me for. They DAM'd me for the you know uh, notorious service in in mm -hmm. Saw Gunner E three ish. Um, How many balloon knots do you have in your good conduct medal? Did you even renew that thing? No, I don't know. I I got to a point the last couple of years where I was like this. I set it up around 2000, we'll call it 12, mm -hmm. 13, or whenever that was, like a few years before I got out. Yeah. I didn't put everything on it because I was just kind of mailing it in. I was like, this looks about right. Nobody else is going to walk around like with a cheat sheet going, you got everything? Because it's ridiculous. You look yeah. like a, you know, Guatemalan general warlord, dude. It's crazy. You, you can't put it all on. Did you put the ribbons or did you put the little bat, the little me medals? No, nah, ribbons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like, the little it's, medals are so ridiculous. They're so ridiculous. I can't believe people do that. I get it. Oh, you know, something so interesting I, I, I saw the other day was like, uh, I saw a picture of a guy who's an infantry officer. He's an O3, and he's a he's a friend of a friend. Captain, so he's a yeah. captain. He didn't have a CIB, and it was shocking. I was like, whoa. An infantry captain? Yeah. A company commander. But he doesn't have a CIB. Wow. You know why? Because there hasn't been a war, dog. So I thought it was Syria. Afghanistan. That It's been a few years since we got out. And guys weren't getting in the mix out there. So, how'd you get your CIB? Was it a rocket attack? The initial one? No. I, uh, the invasion of what? Of Iraq. Like really? Oh three? Yeah. Oh three. Opening the open it up. But I what was the action? Qualified for it. Uh, I mean, there are multiple different. Yeah, but you get actions. you get the action based you, on the first action. You had to have. Uh, either been shot at or attacked by attacked a someone specifically. Yeah. I mean, there are like, I, I forget exactly what all the different things, but it was like, you know, mortars or, you know, IED or small arms fire. Like there were multiple different incidents. And I didn't really necessarily care which one it was. It yeah. was like, cool, we got them. Awesome. It doesn't really matter. I yeah. think I only wore it on my, on my class A. So. Yeah. You don't wear them on your, um, no, guys wore them on their greens. Yeah, I wore, I've worn them on greens, yeah. but I don't wear it on your uh, battle dress uniform mm -hmm. or ACUs. Like I didn't wear anything on my ACUs. I didn't either. Yeah, yeah. I just wore uh, my the master truck driver badge. I just wore that. Yeah. all the time. That's what I rock. What's well, a classy badge? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that thing? Glossed up, oh, fucking badass. Yeah. Like you can't. You can't devalue that. Yeah. You know? I mean, when you think about how hard it is to get your master driver's badge or whatever that is, like, that's a big deal. So you got your CIB in Iraq during the 03. Yeah. 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 You, you, beat know, me, you beat me that's to That's the it. only one you needed. Yeah, the rest true. of them were just like, whatever. Okay. I looked at the, you know, I have this I Love Me book. It's massive. Everybody, that's what we called it, right? Yeah. I Love Me book, career book, whatever. And I was looking through awards and all the stuff that I had. And I've accumulated a lot of shit, a lot of yeah, stuff. of course. But I don't ever want to get rid of that. <clears throat> I want my son to go through it and just yeah. be like, you know, because even I, I, I like look through it, I'm like, oh, I forgot I went through that training course. Oh, like yeah. UAV stuff or right. TSC stuff or whatever the right. biometrics, cover course, like all these yeah. things. I'm like, dude, I don't remember 
doing any of that. And you it's know, not noted anywhere. It's not like it's there's a resume with all the military training that I've done throughout my career right. anywhere. Like I went to ethical hacking school. Fuck yeah, you did. And I'm like, yeah. I forgot all about that. Yeah. Crazy shit. Did you, were you uh, racially profiled to go to that school? Constantly. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was like, this guy's Korean. He can work a computer. Oh, the, there's just no way. I was the, anything smart yeah. and intelligent, they needed me. And then I failed all those schools. <laughs> and then you failed them. I, I was trying to think. I think I have. Um, you cleaned up a little bit. I, I see things look proper. Uh, I'm Whoa, trying to. I'm trying a whole, to what it's is like this? a whole new thing, I think. Yeah, the guys, I, I, I really tried to tell the guys, like, listen, you've got to step up your game a little bit on yeah. this because it looks like a crazy person mm. lives back here, which is technically accurate. You sleep in here. Uh, you see that book? Uh, there's this book called Prepared. Yeah. We should open that up and read the inside again for everybody. Uh, every week we should. I, I'll we read should the forward written by Jack Carr and Ray Porter's so, voice. What's, what's your thing now? You're, you're moving. So the, the thing with Mike right now, he's in the middle of a, 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 or I guess you've already moved from Heber, Utah mm -hmm. down to, is it Provo? Provo, Utah, yeah. Yeah, so your entire shop is down in Provo. And then when are you going to be open down there? Technically, we're open now. Oh, you are? I okay. don't want anybody to show up because it's gross. But okay. technically, we're open now because we're there. Right. Uh, all the employees are there. Um, we went from 6,200 square foot in Heber City to 19,000 square foot in Provo. Okay. So a lot of a bigger footprint of stuff. Right. <clears throat> Why Provo? The winter showed its ass last year. I know yeah. everybody thinks climate control is a thing, but when you look at record highs associated, I mean, everybody would say record lows is climate control too. Sure. But we had the most snowpack in the history of Utah. Right. And we had the coldest temperatures, Jan I think we dr broke January, February, and March for yeah. coldest temperatures. Yep. We had, at the point uh, in which we would normally have 600 inches of pack snow, we had 800 inches of pack snow. Right. Which made it very difficult for anybody to get to Philcraft because mm -hmm. we're up in the mountains. We're yep. 1,500 feet above Provo. And it would make it very difficult um, to justify hosting classes and opening retail. Mm -hmm. So you can't, like, I'm not going to send an employee or a couple employees inside the retail shop five, six days a week when nobody's coming. So we had limited hours, and that frustrated a lot of people. And I get it, because people were driving, like it was a destination to Philcraft HQ, and there's a piece of paper on the door that says, we're not open, call us. And then it'd take 20 minutes for somebody to come and open the door. Right. We were making really good money in retail. Like, I, surprisingly, I didn't even think that was a thing in business. Like, right. you know, you, you, that's your world um, now compared to what direct-to-consumer was. But direct-to-consumer is always the start point for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm selling a bag of, a bag of coffee. I'm selling a survival kit, mm -hmm. and it works. And then I'm like, oh, my God, you can sell it to, to somebody in person, and it covers the overhead of the facility. Mm -hmm. And so we expanded the footprint to include jujitsu. I have... Um, a kid named Devin from Ranger Regiment, him and his wife. His wife is a physical therapist. They actually are building out the gym right now. 3,000 square foot of functional fitness gym space. Uh, 3,000 square foot of jujitsu mats with Greg Lappin, one of our uh, Brazilian black belts who's coming in. And then all the preparedness stuff. I got a CQB shoot house being built this week that you could come in and get tuned up. On. What do you use? Uh, Sims or are you use an Airsoft? Sims. Sims. Uh, Sims and Airsoft. Depending okay. on what we're doing. Yeah. The sim, sim rounds are hot in close proximity, so we use airsoft if we're doing real close. Mm -hmm. um, and then a, a full classroom. We even have space that we can actually evolve into mm -hmm. to put an indoor range, which I talked to you about this morning. That's great. Which would be awesome. Yeah. Big retail, all the things. Mm -hmm. Like we're premiering. You don't know this. So we, I haven't told you nor asked for permission. But the 30th anniversary of Black Hawk Down, of Mogadishu Somalia, Gothic Serpent, is this year, October 3rd, mm -hmm. which took place in 93. Right. We're doing a story survival for Black Rifle Coffee mm -hmm. on the story of Black Hawk Down from one of the operators that was on the helicopter with Shugart and Gordon. I won't spoil it yeah. uh, out, out, out the gate, but we are likely going to premiere that at Philcraft HQ um, a couple days prior to it releasing live 
on YouTube. I think it will get 10 million views. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it will be the most popular content that we've seen in a long time yeah. because of the story and significance of the history. And the story's never been told from this perspective, from this right. particular person yeah. who lost his leg when he was hit with an RPG while trying to loiter and support Shugart and Gordon, who are teammates of his, before he got hit with the RPG. The helicopter limped back to base. They survived because a military JSOC doctor mm-hmm. received him on the ground and saved his life. And we'll have that doctor on the on the um, oh, wow. documentary as well. Yeah, that's great. Like insane, <clears throat> insane. Yeah, I'm 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 looking cool forward to this. I think you know the next the next year of the Black Rifle Coffee podcast, you're going to see a lot of. Uh, basically, we, we went through the last few months trying to figure out exactly what we wanted out of the show. We referenced it a, a few shows back as to how is it changing, w- what's going to happen with it. The big things are, you know, Mike and myself and Andy are going to be the the reoccurring cast. We're going to really try to unpack and organize the way that we we we, we talk about certain things. So, myself, uh, Matt, and Andy, we we we've really decided that we wanted to take it in a different direction versus having multiple different guess we're going to concentrate our effort on very few and select smart guess we're going to talk about very specific subjects so we can try to provide value to those people which lends me to like like some of my questions because i pulled these questions directly from uh user generated questions the soap like, thing the soap thing was like what's the what's mike's preferred Favorite soap <laughs> well, no, it was uh so what well, one of the questions I got was... Are you making this up right now? No. Okay. This is, I mean, you won't know whether or not I, I am or not is irrelevant. <laughs> is, uh, so you're everyday carry because like, there it is. What is it? Uh, P365 XL uh, macro. Okay. Yeah. So it's a 365 that's comped. Bust that thing out. Let me see what you got. So... My cast is at EDC sitting right here. In by the way, I, I'm telling you guys right now, this uh, fanny pack, nut ruck, however you want to, how, however you want to describe this, is the single best fanny pack I've ever had. Yeah. Period. So this is Mike. You got a Comp three six five. It's Comp XL. XL. Yeah. Uh, Seventeen plus one, which is I think the most important factor. Well, yeah, I think so. So basically the same thing that I carry, almost almost identical. Why do you carry this? So I, I think uh, one, the biggest thing with uh, the th- biggest thing with a, uh, a macro yeah. is a lot of people think smaller guns are better because they're more concealable yeah. and compact. Yep. The reality is that's not true. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you think about our, our ag- ag- agency days, we carry Glock 17s. Yep. Why? One, magazine capacity yeah. um, and reliability, I think. Yeah. So the biggest problem with uh, small guns, especially in bigger hand, man hands, is there's too snappy. Shorter barrels, the, the, it, you get a really snappy front end of the gun, and they're hard to manage when the gun's so small. Mm-hmm. The macro has the ability to change grip modules, has a compensated front end, so it keeps the, the muzzle down, and it's about right size yeah. wise. Yeah, yeah. And it's a 17 plus uh, one round um, in the gun, which I, I think is like optimal. Right. Yeah. What do you, what's yours? Same. It's a Glock 365, not the XL. It's not comped. It's a little bit different. Um, and I'll, I'll bring it in the next time. Um, you don't have a comp, you have the XL. I don't have the XL. Yeah. It's just a straight three six five. So yours, yours is twelve plus one or something. Yeah, like yeah. And you know those magazines fit in the XL too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I run the bigger, the, the typically the the larger magazines. The seventeen one. Yeah. yeah. Um, I like comps like ninety nine percent of the time, especially when I'm shooting for fun. I like comps, but you know mine has a flashlight, which I just you. For me, I carry a flashlight, mm-hmm. and it's always attached to the gun. Yeah, a lot of people like to separate the two, yeah. flashlight and I pistol. run them both. Yeah, whereas like I, I'm too forgetful for that, so I yeah. I can't carry a bunch of shit because I'll I'll forget it. I I won't put it in my 
you know, my fanny pack, which by the way, coincidentally, the reason I don't have it today is because I just got back from Dallas. I got in at midnight last night because my plane was delayed multiple times. I finally got home. They lost all my bags to include your check both pistol? my guns. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. Well, if so you need a replacement. I'm waiting. Know. So uh, yeah. I, that, that coincidentally, that's, that's exactly why I don't have a have a gun on me right now is because uh, Delta lost, uh, I was bringing back a rifle and a pistol. It stopped at JT's house. I did his new podcast, which is Time for Pie. Yeah. And I just so, checked everything yeah. and fucking lost every bag, 100%. Yeah. Three bags, all of them gone. So now I've got to figure out where where everything is. So that's why I don't have a pistol on me right now. What else do you carry in your, your Merce? My Merce? This one, this um, I, it's just one mag, one light, so I don't carry an extra mag. Uh, if if I can't handle whatever that is that I'm I'm doing, typically with one one mag, uh, things have gone super sideways for a, a lot of different reasons. Uh, standard kind of like I I carry uh, a couple checks. I, so yeah, I do the same. I cash. Yeah. Checks. Checks. I carry, so I have these challenge coins. So if you guys ever like run into me or see me. You have challenge in, coins? In, yeah, fuck yeah. I have, I have multiple different ch- challenge coins. So if you guys ever run into me in an airport, I, I just gave out two yesterday in the San Antonio airport. One was a Navy uh, pilot mm-hmm. who was like, hey man, recognize you. The other was the pilot flying the plane. Both of them stopped me and said, hey. So I gave him a challenge coin. The pilot flying the plane? <laughs> yeah. 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 Which happens quite a bit actually. If the captain's standing there, like typically they'll they'll like we, we, you know, we have a ton of military people listening to the podcast. So And they're like, mostly Air Force guys. Mo- for the most part. What? Yeah. Air Force? The pilots. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, former they're, they're Air Force like guys. Former, you know, former pilot guys. Yeah. And a lot of these guys have a lot of time to listen to podcasts. So they listen. We, we have a huge following, I guess, from like Delta, Southwest. And they stop me pilots. in Salt Lake City all the time. All the time. Yeah. Um, so you got a tourniquet. I don't carry a tourniquet. Yeah, it's just what I Probably do. should after your rollover. Why I just fucking rolled out of there and like <laughs> airbags away. deployed fine Man, airbags dog. I just um, yesterday in Provo, I was on the sense. I was on the way to HQ, and literally pumping gas at Provo mm-hmm. in a gas station. Yeah, and lady runs a red light in front of me. Like I'm looking at her as really? she runs a red light and T bones another car, and so I run out there and I move her vehicle. I move her out of the vehicle, right. obviously. And then move her vehicle out of the intersection because cars obviously don't care. Nobody yep. actually cares. Yep. And they just drive by me and standing in the middle of the road, mm-hmm. like sixty miles an hour. So I moved the car out of the the way and then sat her down on the curb. And she was in shock, but she also got out of the vehicle holding a cell phone. And I was like, "Are you okay?" She's like, yeah, I'm just shaking up. And like, she's like, "What happened?" I was like, "You ran a red light." She goes, "I know I did. I was just." distracted by my phone and she was holding the phone like because she was still yeah she had just been texting on it a millisecond before right she t-boned another car in the intersection and almost killed somebody and um that happened yesterday what's your um how often do you text and drive be honest i i don't all the time no I don't. that answer is all I don't. the time then i don't you i don't. actually don't i'm actually really good at it i've gotten better since i was since i've had kids yeah, that's fair. And I just, I look around now and judge mm-hmm. people, which is almost like texting. There's people everywhere I go texting with their knee on the steering wheel with two hands. Like I, I saw a guy the other day eating a sandwich with one hand <laughs> and texting, literally like yeah. stuffing his face and then texting while he was driving his, with his knees. I love, I, I love seeing that. I, I just love seeing that. Yeah, it's insane. Because what, what it reminds me of it, it keeps everything. It keeps everything like kind of in check for me, which is one of the things that 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 uh, people have asked me. Like, why, why, why don't why don't you like like to ride a road bike? Well, I mean, there's a combination of reasons why I don't like to ride road bikes. One, yeah. it's lame. Two, yeah. I, I don't feel like I can appropriately fit into all the like dorky garb that they wear, like all the spandex and with the padded butts. In that. What are you talking about? Yeah. yeah you would. With some I think you'd cylindrical look soap. Like one of the one of the, like a cylindrical <laughs> soap hanging around my neck. Uh, 
That's a perfect um, commercial. You in the spandex holding the cylindrical oh soap. Are you sell a, it? Are you a bicyclist? <laughs> well, we have the perfect thing for you. It's a cylindrical soap. And uh, but one of the biggest reasons is that I know that there's, you know, it doesn't matter whether or not you're you're a 15-year-old or 14-year-old with a learner's permit or you're, you know, a 70-year-old, the level of distraction of the road is based on the cell phone. It's 100%. Yes. So at 100% accuracy rate, every person driving typically will have a cell phone. Yes. 100% of the time, they'll have the cell phone in the car. There's not a chance where I would put myself on the road without like essentially an armored bubble that protects me from people that have a distractionary device embedded in their several thousand pound vehicle. Mm -hmm. Also add some like, you know, uh, add drug X to the brain with a cell phone, a few other things. Dude, I, I'm not stepping out on the fucking road with a bicycle. Yeah. What are you, lost your mind? Or like, even a motorcycle. It's, it's dangerous as fuck. And by the way, that's not me being like a little scaredy cat. That's me saying, just look at the data. Yeah. Like you'll get run over by a 15 year old in an F-250 that borrowed it from his dad because they wanted to fucking tweet or TikTok or do something fucking stupid. Yep. And you're going to get fucking run over by him. I'm like, no, like I'm, I'm all good, man. Like I'm all, I'm all good. I've checked that box. Like I, I don't need to ride my bike anywhere. There was this guy I knew in Boulder, uh, really, he's a really good dude. His wife was run over in Colorado three times. By while road biking. While road biking. Yeah. The last time was with a semi truck. She was run over by the semi truck. Wow. Not not like, oh, she got hit and glanced off. No, she was run over by the trailer of a semi truck, like under the tires. Like she had broke everything like her her pelvis was fucking broken like 20 different fucking places like shattered everything like everything was broken and i'm at that point because i used to ride my bike quite a bit actually i was like the road bike yeah yeah i used to ride it everywhere because i was like you know hey it's a great way you're i gotta go down here i'm gonna like get some exercise i'm gonna do x y and z and then watching this person get run over she survived yeah yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. she'll she'll never be the same. Obviously, like once you break your pelvis, like you're kind of fucked. Forty thousand Americans die a year in motor vehicle accidents. Forty thousand. Forty thousand. That's more than people who are killed with guns, by the way, because the gun statistic is like sixty thousand, but sixty percent of that is suicide. Yeah, exactly. So when you look at the numbers, it's like you're more likely, and not only is that like a statistic in deaths, but if you look at uh, actual accidents there's over 2 million accidents where people are injured. I mean, there's tens of millions of accidents. There's like 11 million accidents. Right. But 2 million are injured, and a million out of the 2 million live with lifelong injury from motor vehicle accidents per year. Wow. So the, the likelihood, just like, I mean, yesterday, saw somebody get T-bone. Yeah. The likelihood of you being in an accident and needing like life-saving equipment or needing it for somebody else are significantly higher than anything else you could likely do besides die of a heart attack and in a McDonald's drive through Is that a statistical probability? Three died yesterday in Utah from- Just in a McDonald's drive through McDonald's drive I think one was Chick-fil-A. Oh. One was Chick-fil-A. Sorry, Chick-fil-A. Oh. They got it. Like, it happens. Hey, when you, you need them fries, dog. You got to get them. Are you eating fries? No. I haven't touched a fry in like it, three days. I'm surprised because they're semi-cylindrical. <laughs> I, eat <them> like this. <laughs> I, I, I think when you like just generally run the numbers and, and the statistics of what what I would say are are things that you know you're doing your risk assessments just just in general in your life, right? You're doing your risk assessments. You're saying, okay, I don't need to ride my bike to work. That's cool. Like that's a pretty easy decision to make. Hmm. And now you've just mitigated a huge percentage of injury out of your life, like like that, right? Good. Yeah. Um, don't go to the club at two in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, don't. And this isn't like living in a, in a bubble, by the way. This is just saying, I understand human psychology. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at the data and then making decisions in your life to make sure that, oh, I, I don't want to get fucking run over by a semi-truck. Yeah. Eh, pretty easy. Like, it's a pretty easy decision to make. I think where people think about survival in general, they're, they're they're looking at 
one thing, and you and I have touched on it a few times, they're saying, I need to take like, like pistol carbine course because that's what's going to teach me how to survive. I'm like, highly that, unlikely. Highly unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, highly unlikely this will turn into a, 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 a one, a, a kinetic, like, like humanity and the economy has essentially devolved to the point where you're going to be in this rogue, you know, on the road type scenario where you're defending yourself and your family with a pistol and a rifle and you're hunting for your survival as well. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a statistical improbability. However, if you're just like training for reality, if you look at what are the things that, that are going to happen in the case of a, in the course of a person's life mm -hmm. that you know within, we'll call it the greatest probability that you have to be prepared for. What are those things in your mind? Um, well, statistically, it's cardiovascular, obviously, disease and cancer is going right. to kill you quickest. But I, I think that speaks to resilience. So health and wellness and physical fitness is number one. Right. So get off your ass, train physically, run to work like you do. Right. Um, go to the gym, exercise, eat well, sleep well, because that's the baseline. Because statistically, that's going to kill you quickest. I think second to that is going to be broadly accidents mm -hmm. um, and being indecisive, not paying attention, uh, not maintaining situational awareness is is most of the reason why that statistic is improving. It's escalating dramatically mm -hmm. because we're paying less attention to what's going on around us physically, which means the physical world, which is still doing the same thing it's always done, is handing us our ass. And I think third would be trauma and the the first aid that you would need in all those probabilities across across the spectrum. And I think when you look at that and you look at like even pistol and, and rifle, I don't think it's as important as focusing necessarily on the tactics and learning how to do something specific technically. I think the exposure to stress, because shooting a gun for most people is not comfortable, it's fun, but it's not comfortable mm -hmm. and it pushes them to be better. That incremental gain is going to make you more resilient and better in process. So you can go to a shooting course and yeah, it makes you shoot better, but actually teaches you life lessons to be better in processing information, reacting and adapting to stress. And those things statistically are going to save you because I think the number one characteristic, which I don't think is debatable of surviving anything, especially worst case scenarios, is your ability to adapt under stress. So again, is it specifically shooting the paper target under a stress culmination? No, technically just set that aside, not highly probable, but working through that process of stress will help you manage the getting T-boned by the lady who's texting on her phone and then you having to process that and then do things like to save your ass. like. This lady got out of the car in the middle of an inter intersection, almost got hit. Why? She did, she's never been exposed to stress. She spiked in a sympathetic nervous response, got out like it was fight or flight, except that wasn't going to save her in that moment. Being cognitive and saying, okay, let me take a breath, realize what just happened, and let me get out of the way of traffic so I don't get killed. Right. I knew that coming into it. As I walked and saw her demeanor, I'm like, this lady's going to get hit. And this car is going to cause another accident. Lady, come with me. I need you to breathe and just sit down. You got your car keys. They're in the purse. That's a wreck inside the car because she just T-boned a car going 60. Go inside the vehicle, push to start, and then limp it off. The, the entire rear end of the vehicle was completely annihilated. So I dragged the, the rear of the car 10 feet off the intersection. There was construction cones setting next to it. So I took them and boxed the car. Yeah. So the person driving 60 miles an hour who's not paying attention doesn't kill somebody else. Right. And all of those things are not because I went to a construction cone moving uh, tactic. I didn't learn that in school, but because I've exposed myself to stressors like shoot, move, communicate, I could adapt in that situation um, where most people can't. Yeah, it, it's interesting. It's almost as if like common sense so from a from a prioritization and effort and execution, common sense. In you know Tom, I think it was uh, Mark Twain said, "Common sense is uncommon." Mm -hmm. Right. So in that situation, it's get off, like get out of the road, get off make the sure X. that you're safe. Yeah, yeah, get off the X. Right. So, but a lot of people, 
I don't think they've experienced what I would say is enough complex problem solving scenarios in their life where they would have to one, understand how to triage that that circumstance and how you can triage multiple different circumstances mm. if you understand the complexity and then how to execute against it. Yeah. So critical uh, thinking. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Critical thinking, complex problem solving. So where, where, where do you, where do you go to get that? Like how how do you train preparedness without like going to survival you know, a field craft survival course. Like, how do you do that? It's it's really interesting. I mean, a, a lot of people can do it on their own. Well, when I, I say physical fitness training is the best way to build that base because the same, um, the same mechanism where you hit a wall mentally because your physical body's literally telling your brain, you're going to die if you don't stop. Mm. At a certain heart rate, about 150 beats per minute, you're outside your comfort zone. You're about 70% 70, 70 of your max BPM. That's, a, that's where I like to caffeinate myself to and in, in, yeah. like about 8 a.m. I like to hit about 150. Is that what that's you're looking for? That's optimal. You're optimal. <laughs> that's your optimal zone. So this, I mean, the Yerkes Dotson mm. curve, which actually is an arc of performance where you see a peak of optimization of uh, not necessarily technical expertise, but at least where you're capable and cognitive at the same time. Mm -hmm. That Yerkes Dotson curve at the peak of that is where you want to be most people haven't taken themselves to that and operated in that spectrum. So most of us are like, we get stressed out and we go, ooh, that's an indication, let me stop. And depending on your physical cardiovascular capability, you go out, you start running and you go, ooh, this sucks, I'm gonna stop. So what I tell people is, you know, the best way you could self-control and self-adapt and self-learn is by going out and testing yourself. Mm -hmm. A workout of the day, right? That's That's, a crucible for most people because it's literally written out verbatim and you have to follow the direction. Mm -hmm. And so when somebody says, you got to do this many, many squats, this many burpees, and you're conforming, you go, I've accepted this is going to suck. I do it. And you push through. Most people, when they're doing it on their own, go, well, this sucks. I'm not going to do this anymore. Right? We got to push through that threshold. Right? We got to adapt, build resilience. So I think um, that could be a walk. That could be a hike. That could be an incline. That could be a workout of the day. That could be camping. Exposure to stressors where you feel the stress. Like going camping for most people is not normal, by the way. You know, like I, I talked to a guy the other day and he's like, when I go camping, I go in my car and then I usually go somewhere where I have reception. So that's not camping. That's being homeless for a night. Yeah, that's, that, yeah. that's literally what that's you can do. That's living in your car for a night. Yeah, you, that's what you can yeah. do in your driveway. Yeah. There, there's no difference. So... When I mean go camping, I mean disconnect from technology, be immersed in the environment, um, sleep on the ground under the stars, do stuff that we did as a kid normally. Like that was our, like we did that naturally. For most generations beyond our own, that is not a natural thing. That is very unnatural. What do you mean, dad? I got to sleep on the ground? Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, that's, in fact, when I was a kid, we'd look forward to that. And like, well, I, it's uncomfortable. Yes, it's going to be uncomfortable. We have to build that back into our families, back into ourselves. And it just takes a little intention. I think that's what it is. It's like being conscious, being uh, attentive to the, the lack of that. I mean, we did this rewilding experience with these guys. And post after action review, which is the following morning. I don't know what you're saying right now. You said you know? rewild. How do you wilding? not know my courses? I'm just joking you. I want you to explain you're, this oh, rewilding okay. to the audience. Play along with my Sorry. lack of information. Are your toes the... curled into my toes right now? Are <laughs> your feet linked into yeah, mine? What, what is rewild? What, like rewilding. So rewilding is, it's. I mean, it's a, a borrowed term. But for us, it means primal reset. It means getting back to nature. Mm. So one of the challenges I've always had in uh, owning a company and preparedness, that thought tactical was the solution to everything. Yeah. Most of right. our backgrounds think that. And then realizing nearly eight years into the journey, it has almost nothing to do with anything in preparedness. It's one minutia. I would say one one hundredth of a thousandth. Mm. Um of the piece of the pie. What's more important, 70% of that um, statistic should be focused on building resilience in yourself and your family and in each other. So I used to have resi resilience rendezvous. I think you've heard yeah, of, of course. that. Yeah. And the methodology in resilience rendezvous was teaching like these Huberman tactics, these life hacks, so people can go out in the world and deploy them, but you have to be exposed to them. 
So here's how it works. Here's the science. Mm -hmm. And then you go out to the world and do it. Except that was so comfortable of a course, like a four day course, chef made meals, Fuck living yeah. in a cabin, sleeping oh, yeah. like our kind of course. That's like yeah. what I want to do yeah. because I've had enough resilience built into me. Um, but then we realized, well, if you actually do it outside primarily and you want to establish building these rewilding or mm -hmm. this back to basics methodology, then have them outside, have them exposed to elements. And we did that. I mean, we just did it in hundred degree temperatures in Spanish Fork. A big shout out to Kofaro for letting us use that land that uh, we have a land agreement with. Um, and it changed their lives. Dude, 72 hours in the woods. They come out of it, they have sim sensory deprivation. They go, man, it's weird being around these cars and like all these people. And, like, I don't even want to get on my cell phone. And I'm like, perfect. Now you know what it feels like to primary reset. Mm. Dopamine is metabolized in our system in minutes and in hours. The problem, I think, is we have so much saturation and immersion in technology via the mm -hmm. cell phone. Yeah. And and it's not the metabolic function. It's the after effects. We're like crackheads who are constantly coming off the crack, right? We're, we're constantly in a state of withdrawals. That's the problem. So we don't know what our baseline is. So rewilding is a course to get you back to baseline, give you tactics to reintegrate and recognize Oh, I feel that way, which feels yucky to me. It's time to get off grid. You get off grid, you do a, a, a reset with your family, you know how to teach your family how to get through this, and you come back in the world and you're appreciative of. We felt that feeling, by the way, every single time we went in the field. Oh, yeah. Where the water hits your ass in, in, in your barracks room or the, the hooch or the, the house, and you're like, dude, oh my God, that feels so good. This pillow, I am melting into this pillow. This meal that my wife just cooked is the best meal I've ever had because it resets all your inhibitions that you've been saturated in because we're honestly not living in a state of problems. I mean, first world problems are not mm. the world's problems and aren't real problems. We just manufacture them. Yeah, that's interesting. Do, do you think that humans just manufacture problems because they, they're instinctually wired to, to want drama? Constantly. Yeah. Constantly. Like, like, like I see it because, you know, I see it even within the community, right? It's like, I see it within the special operations community where they're, they manufacture problems and you're like, dude, that's, that's not a real problem. Yeah. You know, like, so other people also need to, to, to understand and hear that because they think that, you know, soft guys are like, they're, they're infallible or, or they're just like these iconic figures that sit on the top of mountains and then, you know, they cross their legs like Buddha and, spill out these these philosophical pontifications around like being fucking incredible like actually they're just like everybody else there's they yeah. have their own like ego issues and they they like to manufacture drama you know and to be fair you know we employ 900 people like i employ 50 percent vets like th there's there's a lot of interesting characteristics that are can they, they they continue to impress me as to the the consistency with some of the the personality traits within the veteran community because they 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 manufacture shit and I I constantly have to remind people I'm like what the fuck are you talking about <laughs> like yeah. well like go home like yeah take a break take a break like go yeah. home like hug your kids like you know hug your wife like turn your phone off yeah. what, 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 why do you give a shit like. A lot of this, like, is is like manufactured drama around people that, that are too plugged into the internet. Mm -hmm. And to be fair, that that's their thing and that's what they're into. But most people don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, like, I mean, I'm constantly amazed. Like, somebody will say, "Hey, have you ever seen this guy on YouTube?" And I'm like, "I have no clue who you're talking about." And then they'll send me a link to somebody. I, I was I was talking to this guy uh, about uh, physics, mm -hmm. something, something, right? And I was like, I've never heard of this dude. It's like 10 million fucking subscribers on YouTube. It's a huge YouTube channel. Never seen this guy ever. Mark Rober? No, it's oh. just like some random dude, right? But I've never seen this guy. But in their world, like in this, in this like world of, of people, like he, that guy exists and he's like an icon. And Everybody knows everything about what's happening within the, you know, the dramatic things. Uh, like uh, somebody was trying to explain this to me around somebody else this weekend. They were talking about some guy that, um, like, 
he he and his wife like they cocked something and like because you know obviously that's a that's a common vernacular for us and they were explaining it to me as if like I understood it. And it's like, I have no fucking clue who any of these people are. I have no context to what you're talking about. And they were just like, what? How do you not know? And I'm like, dude, I'm dialed in. Like, it's not like I'm not dialed in. Yeah. I'm just dialed into different shit. Like, I know what's going on in your life. I know yeah. what's going on in, in uh, you know, Andy Stump or Matt or any of these other guys. I know what's going on in their lives. I know what's going on in the life of the company. I know what's going on in the life of like a lot of our, our a lot of our employees. I just don't fucking pay attention to this shit because yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Well, to people me. you don't know, stupid people you don't necessarily care about because yeah. they're disconnected. Why would you? No, it, and it goes back to kind of like this uh, the, the the hierarchy of needs and being able to understand coherently what's happening and then be able to triage and prioritize the way that you're working. So, like this whole uh, the, the the whole conversation around woke oh, that's it was a whole other thing that we were talking about this weekend. It's like it, I'm sure people think that's important. That's great. I just don't fucking care. Yeah. Out of all the different things that I have to worry about throughout my life, whether or not there are a thousand or two thousand or three thousand genders is not fucking one of them. I don't give a flying fuck yeah. about any of it because it's also a stupid conversation. These are philosophical conversations driven by academics that couldn't get degrees in physics. Yeah. They couldn't do math. So they decided to do something else. So literally, we're allowing this like this this like thought exercise that should have just stayed within a 101 course taught by a fucking academic that could have never passed a, a physics course to just stay there but instead we've allowed you know lower IQ essentially math failouts to drive the conversation and context and how we're prioritizing and triaging social issues when it's like I would much rather talk about, how are we going to fix the geopolitical balancing of power internationally so we don't fucking accidentally or directly push buttons that require us to solve problems with nuclear weapons? Because I'm kind of fucking more interested in that yeah. than I am whether or not we're identifying as a fucking tree frog next week. Don't give a shit, right? Yeah. Don't care. Yeah. Or how are we going to stabilize the U.S. economy and maintain what I would say economic hegemony because that is a strategic imperative to the survival of our country. And also it's a very strategic imperative to the survival of our species if we're not doing sustainable, environmentally friendly economic policies. Mm -hmm. By the way, that's not me being some fucking tree hugger. That's just me saying, hey guys, like we can't poison the ocean because that's kind of where our food comes from. Just like yeah. pointing that out, yeah. not like if you're, kid identifies as a furry and needs a fucking litter box in their sixth grade room. I don't care. Yeah. Don't care. It's it's all just like this low IQ, like pseudo academic philosophical fucking cannon fodder horseshit yeah. that doesn't really matter. Which well, seems deliberate. It seems deliberate they, to cause... get them to run around and chase the tail. Yeah. While there's other shit that are higher priority. And and most certainly a lot, the majority of Americans will chase the tail. Well, it goes back to this conversation. That's what I'm saying. It's like, it goes back to resilience yeah. in survival. It's almost like America needs a course. Our, our country needs a course on survival yeah. and resilience. Yeah. Like they need a, they need a course called like tough at the fuck up buttercup. Yeah. They really do. Yeah. Like they're, they're worried about a bunch of nonsense like it just like, it makes no sense like they're worried about some person that has like two and a half million or 10 million followers on social media and what type of you know pants they're fucking wearing mm -hmm. and like they can't understand how to like go and get a workout in so they don't die 15 years yeah. earlier from a, a, a completely avoidable cardiovascular disease mm -hmm. that Ultimately, they're going to yield themselves a, 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 to a dead end road of taxpayer burden that ultimately is going to be a drag within the rest of the country as well. Mm -hmm. So they, they're more con, they're more they're, they're more concerned with consumption than they are with the actual substance. That's what it is. It's consumption. Yeah, they it's just consumption. Love, we're just eating it all up. Yeah. I just had a I did a reacts video on a Ohio police officer. So state troopers pulled this dude over who he's missing a mud flap on a semi-truck. 
on a cement truck. Oh, yeah, a, okay. a semi truck. Oh, a semi truck. Yeah. So they go to pull him over, and yeah. the dude runs. Nobody knows why he runs. A young dude, I think, twenty three years old. They finally pull him over. Uh, some of the theories are he didn't know that he was being pulled over. I mean, you're driving a semi truck, you're on your cell phone, you might not know state troopers are behind you, right? He eventually pulls over, no prior arrest history or record, was legitimately transporting goods as a truck driver, gets pulled out of the truck at gunpoint by state troopers, appropriate because he seemingly ran from police. He gets pull, pulled out of the vehicle. He's on his hands and knees with his hands raised, and one of the state troopers' body cam footage is, is saying, this cop is saying, the state trooper is saying, don't let the dog loose. Don't let the dog loose because there's a – two police officers who pulled over from a city police, and this is a state trooper event. Right. They're on highway, and one of them has a dog, a Malinois. And he releases the Mal on the dude who's on his knees with his hands raised. And the Mal mauls the dude, rips his arm apart, thrashes him, and the state troopers are, like, pissed. They're like, get him off the guy. They're yelling at him. There's this big conflict, whatever. I do a reacts to this. During the video, I say, guys, like, number one, I'm not an expert at in in mouse, but I am likely the closest thing besides the actual guy who trains a dog. Why? I work with Malin's, Malinois my whole career. Right. I've actually worked tier one dogs uh, in combat when we had a handler that had to go back for a family emergency. I worked his dog while he was gone. That winded up getting killed on target. I had a uh, a unit dog, an SMU dog, save my life in combat. Bit a suicide bomber 15 yards in front of me and saved uh, me and a kid named uh, Rob, a, a, a man named Rob, we would have stepped on this dude and he would have clacked off and killed us. Mm. That happened. So I, I'm, I'm at least somewhat knowledgeable of what Miles do. So I said, one, the cop was screwed up. He should have never did that. And I said it vocally. I don't care. Like the, the, I did a video, or I did Rogan's podcast, and we're, we're talking about SEAL Team 6 operators. And how SEAL Team 6 operators, when they get out of the military, they want to find in their transition something that feels like how they felt on the teams. Except they go and they become a cop. And I said, almost verbatim, I said, they were, they're in the varsity, and then they get back, and I'm, they're not even in varsity. Meaning it's like a different game. It's a totally different game. It's a totally different game. Yeah. So I'm not comparing uh, uh, apples and apples. It's apples and oranges. Right. And so I'm saying, as a SEAL Team 6 operator, which you go out every night in combat when you're downrange and you kill bad guys, when you come off of that and you transition to a police officer, not even a SWAT guy, I use the patrol officer is what sure, I said, sure. you're writing tickets. And Joe said, you're writing tickets. Well, that was cut and everybody's like, I had cops literally DMing me saying, F you, Mike. We're, uh, we're not. We're not junior vars varsity. We're not JV. I was like, okay, that's not what I said. <laughs> but but okay. And, and then my question was to these guys who were emotional. These men were so. I had a dude who was like, mother f and mother f and I, I hate you. I used to respect you. How could you call us JV? And I said, oh, let me ask you one question because you're very emotional. I get it. Get, let, I'll I'll explain if you want me to. But let me ask you one question. Do you think you're a SEAL Team 6 operator? Do you think the equivalent of what you do is being a SEAL Team 6 operator? That's a simple question. Simple. Because even, even the most um, elite, I would say L LAPD's uh, SWAT team, full-time SWAT team, is elite. They, they get a lot of calls. They do a lot of hits. They actually kill a lot of guys. Mm -hmm. That is still not even close to what SEAL Team 6 does and the unit does uh, as special missions unit downrange in combat. So I was making the correlation there. People get emotional. I had a cop reach out to me and say, Mike, you should know better. Like, one, he put me on blast on social media, which I always love. But people hit me up and like, do you see this? And I'm like, what is it? And this dude's like, you should know better. You know dogs are not used as deadly force. And I'm like, what the, f what are you talking about? And, and then I hit up this guy who I follow and he follows me. So we're right. social buddies. And he says, well, you should know better. You said dogs are killers. And, and you should know better. There's case law that doesn't allow us to use those dogs for deadly force. And I'm like, please tell me you're joking. Please tell me you're joking. And he's not joking. So I said on the video, dude, these dogs are vicious. They're killers. Just like I say, Cam Haynes a killer, right? Like he's a killer. He is. I don't mean literally he goes out and kills people. 
Just like I don't mean a Belgian Malinois goes out and murders people. I don't think in the history of, bring up the case law, in the history of working dogs, I've never heard of a civilian law enforcement dog killing anybody. Like, I, I don't even know where the hell that comes from, but I said it on YouTube, like, these dogs are killers, which I mean, they're like vicious. And he said, you've offended me. That's the world that we live in, in fragility. Yeah, yeah. We have grown ass testosterone filled <laughs> men <laughs> who are virtue signaling in the mirror, flexing yeah. on his account, flexing in the mirror. And he's so emotional because he's like, you're giving us a bad name. Like, how about you stay in your fucking lane? Like, you're talking about this one thing that means nothing. And that's what happens when you have former military guys, high testosterone individuals who don't have real world problems, right? There's no crisis. There's no issues. So they look for it because they're problem solvers. Mm -hmm. What happens when you go out and you're a problem solver and there's no problems to solve? You make shit up. When you're a hammer, everything's a nail. Yeah. Right? It's yeah. that and that's, standard and thing. That's what your life will be. And we've seen them. We've seen the same personalities the same characters, the same cast. Mm -hmm. And you know where they are 10 years later in the same place they were when they were, we identified them 10 years ago. Well, I, I, I think the best analogy that I used to, you know, I still do actually, I still use it quite a bit. Like there, there's a difference between the way that nuclear power is utilized and you can use it from any, you know, uh, an, an analogy from a power perspective, but nuclear power is the most obvious and most effective analogy, which is like you can power a city off the power or you can destroy one. So however you're utilizing your power, right? Because you, you only have so much power that you can actually generate and then direct in your life. Mm -hmm. There's only so much. So if you're one individual generating power and directing that power into the things that are gonna provide you a direct ROI, if you're doing that in a negative way, you're gonna get a negative return. That's just the way it goes. Power directed into positive things in your life that are gonna create the, not only the feedback loop that you want, which is it, it, it's applying those things like into your friends, into your family, into your business. It's how are you directing that? Now, if you're directing negative power, and I don't want to sound like some weird fucking guru. That's I, I, I don't yeah. I don't I don't even buy into that like guru horse shit. It's just a matter of physics and principle. Yeah, allocation of it's, attention. It, it, yeah. it's, truly, it's like oh, if you're going to do a hundred push-ups a day you're going to build more representative power within your chest and your arms. It's just the way it is. If you take your intellectual, physical, and your emotional capabilities and you drive those things into the things that matter, your family, your friends, your business, and you're not directly contributing into the negative, like the negative ROI, you're going to win. That's just the way it goes, yeah. man. Over time. Like it's, yeah, over time because yeah. it has to be compounded. It's year after year. Year after year. It's day after day. It's just like one foot at a time. There's that saying, you know, a journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. Mm -hmm. More importantly, it starts with one step and it has to continue time and time and time again. And then it adds layers and layers and layers on what you're trying to build. From a principled perspective, in the context of survivability and resilience and like people, I think they need to take stock in the way that they're, they're utilizing their time. Mm -hmm. They have to look, I, I think the most important thing that we continue to reinforce is looking at their phones and saying, how much time am I allocating to this phone? What am I getting back? What is my ROI? And I was looking at my screen time the other day because I, you know, the, you can look at how much screen time yeah. you have. I was like, oh my God, I've got so much screen time. And I, I look at it like weekly at least. And I, I was like, fuck, I have so much screen time. Holy shit. And, um, but then I realized I was like, oh, hold on. I've been playing chess with, I've been playing chess online. <laughs> like, like, so I'm like on chess.com and I'm like playing chess. And I'm like, oh, well, okay, I got a screen time, but truly yeah. I'm just like, like my wife's got a chess tournament coming up. My kids play chess. I'm just trying not to lose my ass every time they fucking play me. So, but it, I was like, it was shocking. And it like made me take a step back and think about it. Like, oh shit, I, I got too much screen time. And I know because I see it and you see it. I see it everywhere. I, everywhere I go. Like yesterday I was in the airport for, I don't know, six hours. And I answered, I don't know how many fucking emails. I don't know how much time I spent like answering emails and communicating, whether that was, direct phone calls, texts, or emails. But you know what I saw most everybody in the airport doing? The thumb scroll, man. 
yeah. just the fucking thumb scroll. Mind and it was, me. dude, it was a 100%. It wasn't, here's a fractional percentage. 100% of the adults in the airport, when I was looking around, were just like, Right or left hand, that thumb fucking scroll just going up and down, up and down, up and down. Mindless. It was wild. And it it continues to to wake me up and plug me back into the things that actually matter because I've always been that guy that looks around and says, you know, I can see what other people are doing and either what I want to do in order to try to emulate them or what I don't want to do which will allow me to, to live a more fulfilling life. Like, and, and there are points in our life when we have to make those decisions. We have to look around and say, okay, these people around me, just in general, they're stopping in the drive throughs They're, you know, getting those 10 gallon fucking milkshakes and, you know, 50 pounds worth of fucking fries. They're, over utilizing antidepressants. They're not physically active. They don't see the sun. More importantly, they're not being available to create positive value within their family's lives. Well, first first and foremost, it's self-aid, then buddy aid. It's like if you're not in physical, emotional, or intellectual, if you don't have those, if you do not have physical, emotional, or the intellectual capacity to help yourself, you can't, you help, can't help anybody else. It's fucking self-aid, buddy aid, man. These principles apply all the way through everybody's life. And- that's the, ba- the like for me, when I start to focus a lot on being able to prioritize and triage my time, the first thing I look at is like, how much time am I wasting what I, what I call grinding fucking sausage? How much time am I wasting doing nonsense bullshit mm. versus going, anything is better. Like just wa- going for a walk is better. Mm. Like going for a walk and getting some vitamin D through sunlight and putting your phone down and just going out and like literally being present in the moment mm. is better than scrolling through fucking Instagram because yeah. it's stupid. Yeah. It, it, I mean, quite literally, like whether you look at any of the social platforms, it's somewhat irrelevant to your life. It yeah. doesn't create value. It's definitely not going to be one of those things. It's the catalyst to change that disproportionately yields you the results that you want in your life. Mm. The catalyst to change that will reward that will reward you the most is putting it down and only utilizing it when you need it. Mm. Straight up. It's a good life lesson. It's a good life lesson, yeah. But finally, before we close this out, I, I was this weekend at a funeral. And this is my first weekend off. Like, I, I swear to God, two years. First weekend off in two years. And you went to a funeral. I, went, I had to go to a funeral. Right. And what's shitty is it was for a subcontracted employee whose son committed suicide in the same cemetery plot as Neil. Right. Um, so between Neil, Ian, my subcontracted employee who's really close to us at Fieldcraft, right. and his losing his son now, I do. there is a – systemic issue going on in our country that's going to get worse with time Mm -hmm. and and when i i I don't know the circumstances it's 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 really none of my business i i do want to understand it because i want to understand how to educate and prevent it in the future but we have a lot of young people and old people uh, older people who are feeling the pressures of all these things and they're checking out i don't know the specific reason of why this happened the thing happened with Neil, the thing happened with Ian, the thing happened with all these guys in my life, and, and you know as well, these guys in your life as well. But it scares me, man. It scares me for um, the country. It scares me for families. It scares me for us trying to build communities and tribes and trying to bond together when this is happening. And it seemingly, statistically, it's it's a fact. It's getting worse. But when you see drug overdoses, homelessness, all the bad statistics, it seems like we are headed in a direction where there's no recovery from. And the only thing we have control over is what we could do as individuals, like you said, self-aid, and taking and policing up our family. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would have thought, you know, um, especially being associated with Philcraft, all the resilience was built, and we were doing a really good job, but it hits super close to home, and I'm like questioning everything. And 
you know, young people have uh, insurmountable pressures trying to keep up with the Kardashians that they've never had before, where they'll never keep up because the algorithm won't allow it. Mm. Um, and we need a fix. And, you know, uh, responsible citizens and focusing on mental health, building resilience in the community with physical fitness, health and wellness, jujitsu, we're going to try our damnedest in our own backyard, which is, I think, where it starts for us personally. Um, but we'll, we'll try our best. I mean, I have a homeschooling seminar in September, September 30th on a Saturday next month um, because I want my kids to be homeschooled and I want them to grow up resilient. And with all the peer pressures that exist and near peer um, experiences where kids are re not responsible for raising each other, mm -hmm. but that's what we're doing when we send our kid off to school to the wrong school. Yep. They're not developing because, well, or don't you think your kids are not going to be socialized? Yeah, that's what happens when you send them with a whole bunch of kids you don't know and their family situations are shit shows. They're going to be raised by those kids. So what's their first impression of a male or female role model, likely college, with a radical professor, and they buy into the the narrative. We can't do that. And I, I think, man, we got to take back uh, onus and we got to take back, back responsibilities that we've outsourced. And I'm just advocating for that. And if you're suffering from mental health issues, don't just find help. Talk to somebody. Because the first time you say it out loud, you'll realize very rapidly that everybody's going through some kind of drama. That likely your drama, because we did this in rewilding, like we had a sharing of burdens at a mm -hmm. fire. It's like, <laughs> dude, I'm saying this stuff out loud like it's a burden. And then you go around to other people's burdens and you're like, holy sh, 31 years you've been dealing with that problem? Right. Holy crap. Like this ain't so bad. Right. It's not so bad, but we need to talk about it more and be more open. That that includes dads and moms who are listening to this. Talk to your kids, do, do the best you can. And at the end of the day, you could do it all. And it's still... Um, might not mean the difference, um, but we at least could try. Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that's a that's a positive, it's a positive end note, which is like self aid, body aid, and you can you can you can do you can try to do it all and plug in, and guess what? You will make an impact because if you've got thousands of people and tens of thousands of people are plugging in and making an impact, it's incremental gains basically, and we're pulling back the control from the device. Like I think honestly, this is probably the systemic issue that what we're dealing with is algorithmically driven based on the visual representation of other people's lives. Mm. I think that's the accelerant. Same. I, I mean, I do. I sad. Just, it's sad. So I think pulling that control back in, plugging in and being present in the physical, the physical reality is going to be so fucking important to just building good humans. I mean, if not... I mean, it's bleak. It's a bleak future of like, you know, but the robots will just be like, you know, be plug, plugging us into like wherever, wherever they need us. I mean, Issuing. Point, yeah. You know, like well, they're going to find energy out of like using our brains for something. I don't know. But I mean, it's yeah. like if we don't kind of like pull ourselves out of this, like it's going to be a. We're screwed. Yeah. They'll be issuing out cylindrical shaped soap to everybody. <laughs> and we pull it back rope. in. All right. Thanks, Mike. See you guys. Later, Mike.